everything okay in here as well? Yeah, I think we're good. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for jumping into another episode of The Green Room. Um, excited to have a special guest here uh, to chat with us today, a good friend of mine, Esther. Um, if this is your first time rocking with us in The Green Room, uh, we are here to share insights and stories and journeys of uh, black and brown geniuses from all different walks of life. Um, some have been in the tech industry, some have been artists, some have been you know, in VC, uh, some have been product managers. So there's all different types of folks um, who have bumped our heads a lot, who've stepped in a lot of potholes and we want to review what we've done so that you might be able to take some gems and some, some good learnings that we've uh, been able to experience and take them for yourself, put them in your back pocket and help, hopefully those will be helpful for you as you navigate uh, not only your career, but your just life in general. So um, we just got done teaching a course at the Stanford University D School and these green room conversations are a supplement to that course. Uh, so again, thank you for coming along on the ride with us. And without further ado, I will introduce our special guest, Esther Iorinde, uh, and ask her to just introduce herself, take you know three, four or five minutes, Esther, to give us a little bit of who you are, uh, where you are, what you're up to these days, and then we'll jump into some conversation. Awesome. Brandon, thank you so much for having me. Uh, certainly excited to be part of this community and hear so much more and chat a lot more as well. Um, so as uh, Brandon mentioned, Esther Iorinde, uh, gosh, when you ask, who am I? There's so many aspects to it because typically that question is asked and it's answered in, here's what I do in my day job. But there's, uh, there's multiple aspects of it. I am a fiance. Um, I am a, uh, thank you, thank you very much, um, of, of which a fiance of which our wedding uh, has been moved. So I'm one of those that have been affected by, or the, what, there's like a hashtag COVID wedding yes. or COVID weddings being moved. I don't know. I missed it. But anyway, um, but yes, uh, I'm a fiance, soon to be wife. Um, I am a sister of uh, one of three sisters. Um, I am Nigerian. Uh, by ethnicity and um, British by nationality of birth, um, but American by citizenship, if you will. So a bit of a mix uh, in there. Um, in terms of my career, I consider myself a tech business athlete. Um, I've had the pleasure, I've had the luxury, excuse me, and the privilege of working in the tech, tech industry by accident. Um, but being a, um, but coming from a family of artists and growing up in the arts, it has really opened my eyes to be a new wave of creativity. Um, and so I'm, I'm truly enjoying that journey and letting God kind of take me in the direction that uh, makes sense to go in. Um, I am a daughter, I am a cousin, I am a granddaughter, all the things. I'm also a dog mom, proud dog mom of two, Harry Bradshaw and Scott. Richard Scott. Very cool. Uh, well, thanks for the, the introduction. And um, I think I've met one of your dogs and the second one, maybe after COVID is cleared up, I have to uh, hold and cuddle and pet, but uh, that might take a little they will while. Gladly take it. That will, they will gladly take it. <laughs> so maybe first question, um, I know that 2020 has been a year for everybody uh, watching this, uh, for you, for me. Uh, let's just start with how you're doing. Um, you know, any lessons and takeaways from 2020? Like we've had to be resilient and bounce back from a lot. We've had to be human and be there for each other. But then uh, we've also had to look inward and just like ask yourself, ask myself every day, like, Brandon, how are you feeling? Esther, how are you feeling? Yeah. How uh, let's start there. How are you? And, um, you know, reflect a little bit on 2020 thus far. Yeah, yeah. I feel, how am I doing? I feel resilient. Hmm. And I've been trying to use that word when people ask me that question of how are you doing? Um, as opposed to I'm good, everything's great. But, but acknowledging that um, 2020 has been a journey in multiple ways. But at the same time, we're still here, um, and you know, close to 300,000 in the America in in the U.S. don't get to say that, 
um, but but we're still here. So I would say resilient. Um, I think 2020 has certainly been um, a year of uncertainty, a year personally for um, lack of control Mm -hmm. and learning to deal with that lack of control. Um, It's been educational as well, given, you know, some of the racial divide in the country, some of the um, political divide in the country and really seeing different perspectives. Um, But it's also been one where I've learned a lot about um, extending myself grace, Hmm. given just everything we've, we've, we've experienced and gone through. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to say, you know what, this is really tough right now. And so I've got to give myself grace to be able to feel, get better, um, give myself space Mm -hmm. for recovery so that I can then be there for others in my life, my significant other, my family, my team, uh, my extended team, my peers, my friends. Um, So, yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, I'm doing. Thanks for sharing. And um, I think that check-in question is a good one before we jump into our business every day or before we jump to uh, maybe the the quote unquote main thing, I think that it's instructive for us to be able to have that check with ourselves and also to check with others. So if you're watching this, feel free to steal that from us. I think it, you know, nobody will slap you on the hand or uh, make you apologize for asking how they're actually doing uh, before you get into your thing. So um, you mentioned like, um, Nigerian by ethnicity, and you met, you mentioned kind of Britain, and you mentioned kind of the United States. Uh, what was it like, you know, rewind some decades and take us back to like you growing up? Did you always know that you were going to be uh, a technology business athlete? Or like did little Esther have kind of different, you know, dreams and goals, and you kind of just Uh, found your way into what you're doing today. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So much in that. Um, And, and the two pieces in that uh, question are around, did you always know that you would be doing what you're doing today? Um, And what would, it would little Esther have said towards that and the intersectionality of, you know, having three passports, UK, Nigerian, and American as that little Esther. And how did, how did she kind of envision this, this path? Um, you know, Brandon, I don't know if you read the book, um, the four agreements. Mm-mm. Have you ever read the, Oh, love this book Four agreements. Um, one of the things they talk about in the book, they talk a lot about, um, domestication of human beings mm-hmm. and how, um, you know, you're taught at an early age to know what right or wrong is. You're taught at an early age what a good career is. Yeah. You're kind of, you know, you're brought up to really um, see adults or those older than you are in higher power as more all-knowing and they know what's right for your life and your career and, and your uh, endeavors in life. And um, certainly one that was very true for younger Esther, right? I grew up in London, born in London to Nigerian immigrant parents. And if you know anything about the Nigerian culture, there's really three, uh, three uh, ways you can go routes you can go in terms of your career, doctor, lawyer, or engineer um, is pretty much it. And so, um, but, but I had, uh, you know, I had the luxury also of having um, creatives uh, and creatives as parents and, and um, those that had a empathetic heart to, to give more to the world. My dad uh, was um, a pastor and my mom um, heavily into the arts, but had to get into business and finance and other areas. And so she really tried, my mom really tried to instill the arts in um, our lives growing up, right? We We all grew up in musical theater and, you know, she tried to get us to try every instrument we possibly could. and so, you know, we, we just got exposed to so much, uh, much younger. And if you had asked me as a kid, I would have thought I was going to, you know, dance on Broadway or something or, or stand, start a dance school uh, with all of my friends, right? Um, but, but later on, that, you know, that uh, domestication sits in and you start to realize that what gets the attention of parents or, 
what gets the approval of adults or are things like when you agree with your mom's statement that, ah, oh, I'm going to be an engineer yeah. or right. You, you see that that approval sits in. They talk about this a ton in the book. And so um, I, I noticed that uh, two things about myself, one people pleasing mm-hmm. and second that uh, that thought that, ah, oh, my mom thinks I should be an engineer. So I should probably be an engineer. And the more I talk about it with other people, they say, Ooh, you want to be an engineer? And the adults kind of like it. It sounds good. Uh, and that approval uh, sat sat pretty well with me. And fast forward uh, later, I, I kind of did dual duty for a while mm-hmm. um, where I was in the arts. I stuck on to dance. I, I danced uh, throughout like most of my childhood and then uh, professionally in the NFL and NBA, as I think you know. Um, and then on the side, I had this like double life, if you will, of, well, I've got to go be an engineer somehow. So I then went on to Santa Clara University and studied computer science um, and thought that that's, that's, that's makes sense. I can just do this double life. And if I satisfy that side, I should be okay. And I can at least have my real self on the side. Um, my junior year, I just made, um, I just made my first NFL team. I started my first company and I had a big smack in the face, like, I can't do all these. Yeah. The only way I'm going to be successful is if I'm my, on myself. And so I figured out a way to merge that to be a lot more myself. Mm-hmm. And that was a business athlete. I love people. I love figuring out how to solve problems for, for people and to help people. Um, I loved the creative aspects of technology, but I still love dance. And so I figured out a way to, to merge all of those into one and, if, if I could look back and tell younger Esther anything about, uh, you know, what I've learned and now being the business athlete I am now is, you know, figure out who you are first, not what you're domesticated to be. Figure out who you are first. And that snowflake is what's going to provide the most value to the people you're around. Yeah, that's amazing. And to, to hear that it came together for you uh, early, like in your early 20s, as opposed to people who have to like figure out what they want to be when they grow up. And then it you know, jobs happen to them, you know, through their 20s. And then by the time maybe they're 30 and uh, maybe they're married or have a couple kids, they're like just getting into kind of how to balance mm-hmm. everything. Uh, was there a particular moment um, or a particular thing that helped you crystallize all of that so that you could bring your real self and then your business self professional all into one? Or did it take a year or two kind of in your earlier 20s to put a strategy together that would help have you bring mm. that stuff together. You know, full transparency, Brennan, I'm still figuring that out. Mm. I don't have it all completely together. There isn't like a, ah, a light bulb went off when I was 19 and started my first company and said, all right, this is going to be the journey for my life and, and keep going. I've certainly had the privilege of um, being an immigrant, but moving to the United States. Mm. I've had the privilege of, um, having parents that are heavily involved in my education and the direction of my education. I've had the privilege of um, having family in different countries around the world. So perspectives are, you know, that I get exposed to are certainly different. Um, And then just throughout my career, I've had the privilege of having the opportunity to work for um, uh, high end tech companies that has helped catapult myself. And I think also my family, um, economic, like socially and economically, right? Um, which I know I've grown up with folks who who haven't, right? And, and just like yourself, right? We're 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 kind of that that view into that world for our communities and our friends, you know, where we grew up with. So um, I wouldn't say that I, at the age of nineteen, twenty, um, figured it all out and it came together, and I've been on the path. I would definitely say it's been and continues to be a journey. Yeah. Um, but what I constantly find is the more I focus on my strengths and the more I focus on what's innate to me um, and listen to that center, um, the better I feel, the better, the more confident I am about what value I can bring and um, the more valuable that, that contribution is, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if any table you're going to show up to, you want to show up and provide value, 
but it's really hard to show up to that table and provide value when you're trying to be just like the person to your right or to your left, then you might as well not be there because the person to your right or to your left are already there. So what's the point of you being there? But when you show up, you're your snowflake and only you can bring that particular, um, particular value. So I, I would say it's been, it's been a journey. Um, I still struggle with it. I still work on it. I mean, if coming from a family where um, assimilation equals survival <laughs> yeah. is what we've been taught, uh, at least from an immigrant family, especially from a Nigerian immigrant family, you know, which Nigeria in general is, is um, you know, only recently in this century <laughs> recovered from colonization, right? To then migrate over to um, the UK and then again to the US. Assimilation has been survival. And so to break that chain that we've kind of been conditioned to do yeah. is, is a constant struggle and a journey and a journey. So. Yeah, that's, you mentioned um, kind of Britain in the UK. I'm actually watching the crown right now. And I don't know if you're right. into that show or not, but um, there's so much about kind of UK history and British history that I had no clue about. Um, mm. And I think a lot of us, uh, we go to school and we do kind of our major or we do our, our thing, but uh, a, a deep interest in history, I couldn't say that I meet too many young people that are like so fascinated by it. But as I've gotten older, kind of the history of things and you start to ask, how did this thing get to be the way that yeah. it is? And you have to go through kind of the history of the thing in order to fully understand it. And um, just a question about kind of the, the history from the three different kind of ethnic or uh, citizenship or like the three passports that you hold, uh, was history kind of emphasized in your household and like knowledge of how things came together or is it was it later in life where you started to more appreciate and more pay attention to it? Yeah, such a good question. Um, I would say when we were much younger history was a significant focus but um a particular history and a history that was in the encyclopedias or the books or that was written that that you know when we were younger uh my parents with a heavy focus around education really wanted us to hone in on mm -hmm. i would say later on now there's been a hunger for knowledge from my generation and below within our family around the real history and the passed down history from our culture, which is often not written. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's often um, by word of mouth through, you know, the elders who pass it down. And so there's a large focus within our family now of really understanding, you know, where my grandfather who uh, is no longer living, but I've not met what was his life like? What, what did he care about? What was important to him? What were his strengths that he may have passed down? What was his father like? Yeah. Um, what did they have to deal with in, in the country during that time that made it to where they made the choices they made for their families or, right? And so um, that's been a lot of the focus uh, as of late. Nice. But yeah, it's, um, you know, you meet some people, uh, I don't know, the, the term like regular black has been thrown around and like people who mm. grew up African-American in the United States that don't necessarily have kind of the tie back to the continent. Um, you can only like trace back your family tree up to a certain point. So I've, I've done a little bit of research to try to find for my own family, like what that means, uh, what were the names, the last names, like how did folks get together? You know, what did they value? How did they immigrate from Mississippi to Chicago. Yeah. Uh, it's been fascinating for me uh, to do personally. And I would encourage anybody who is watching this to really understand and take advantage of those elders who are still alive. Ask them those questions, you know, yeah. listen to those stories and put them in your back pocket so that your kids and your next generations that'll come will actually have that, uh, those data points. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, you've, you come from a pretty lively family that appreciates kind of creativity. Um, maybe talk a little bit about, uh, are you the oldest sister, middle, youngest? Where, where do you fall in your, in your line? Yep, yep. So I'm the oldest of three. Okay. Um, I'm the overbearing, 
I don't know what you would call it. My, my youngest sister says, you're the other mom. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm the oldest of three uh, sisters. Um, my middle sister and I are three years apart, and she currently works in the arts today. She graduated from Howard University, summa cum laude, and is currently um, in, in part, as she graduated from their film department, film and communications department. And she is currently an artist. She's an actress and a writer today. Um, most recently in the Harriet Tubman um, biopic as Harriet's sister. Mm-hmm. And um, my younger sister uh, is five years younger than me. And she is uh, an artist, a writer, um, a musician, a model for every body, she, every body part. She says, she says her, um, her quote is, all of my parts are fruitful. Like she literally has agents for her hands, for her feet, yeah. for her eyes, um, hair. I mean, she's just she's just figured out how to monetize that industry. Like wow. I didn't, I didn't know it was possible, and she has. So that's super cool. Something I know absolutely nothing about. Uh, having listen, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> um. So then like the question that I had around kind of having siblings and like where you fell, like uh, what are some of like the lessons, you know, from early on, you know, being the oldest child, being the the second mom, um, now that you've got a team at work and now that you've had to, you know, be the CEO of your own company, like what, what childhood learnings from your place in your family have you taken to like apply into the business world and being an entrepreneur? And, and that kind of thing. Oh, man. Good question. Um, well, I will say I've learned a ton from my sisters. Mm-hmm. I've turned, learned a ton from my sisters. Both of them, like I told you, we grew up in the arts. They actually went with it and made that part of their career. Mm-hmm. Um, and careers that uh, if, if those know much about the arts, it is, it is a grind, right? Every day is some form of rejection to then get that, you know, sub 10% uh, shot that isn't a rejection that turns into a large payoff. So it's high risk, high reward. Yeah. And the, the three major things I've learned from their experience there that I've brought into the business world is number one, and I mentioned this earlier, resiliency. Mm-hmm. You've got to be resilient and you've got to know yourself to take that much rejection on a regular day basis and not based on your intellect, not based on your degrees whatsoever, mm-hmm. but based on how tall you are based on, you know, your hair color that Mm -hmm. week, based on the texture of your curls, um, based on how high pitched you sound playing that, that individual within the script, right. To take on that much rejection on a regular day basis to then get that one gig that, you know, puts you on a billboard or puts you in an Academy Award winning movie. Um, it, it takes resilience. Right. So I'd say number one is resilience. Um, Number two, and I mentioned it earlier, which is really knowing yourself. Yeah. And really, really knowing and owning who you are um, and learning to continue to learn that person, get to know that person, love that person, appreciate that person. Um, So that I've really appreciated about uh, their hustle. And the third thing I would say is they hustle. I mean, it's, it's, they diversify how they monetize their brands. Mm. Like it, it, um, in the, the entertainment industry as a whole is evolving, right? And evolving to where it's no longer you are just a singer and you have said contract and you check in to work with your yeah. music industry label and you check out of work and here's your check that you get from music industry label, right? Artists are brands. And there are several ways to monetize a brand, just like any company, there could be several ways that they diversify their portfolio of products or services they sell on the market. And um, I've really seen them evolve from their art to uh, digital ways to consume their art to the different um, um, portfolio products or services that they could offer based on their brand. And so I've definitely learned um, you can absolutely be a, an athlete that has multiple positions you could play, 
Um, just figuring out where your strengths lie and being able to monetize them um, has been the, one of the biggest lessons I've learned from them. Yeah, I think that athlete metaphor is um, is apropos just in, in terms of looking at like a LeBron who has a school, I promise school in Akron. He's got, you know, a Nike shoe deal for decades, probably. He's got his entertainment company. Right. He works for the LA Lakers. So he's got multiple kind of streams of, of income coming in. And for everybody like listening to this, I think that it's um, really, really important, especially as we move into the future to think of yourself differently. So to think of yourself yeah. as not just one thing, but like a combination of things. And then the question that it begs is how much time will you dedicate to kind of the different components and compartments and a lot of that will probably have to do with the combination of how passionate you are about that thing. Um, what's the return of, uh, of that investment in time and getting better on that thing that it can pay back yeah. to you? And, um, you know, how does it fit and align to like your, your life goals, like the, the dream that you have for yourself at the particular moment? Because we know that dreams kind right. of change as we go year in, year out. Uh, for sure, nobody was thinking 2020 would be uh, the way that it is. But like some people's dreams have skyrocketed. If you had a media and entertainment company or a streaming company or an educational, you know, collaboration yeah. system, you know, any number of no, things, what if, no. they took off. But then other folks maybe who are in the, you know, retail industry or travel or other things. Had to transform, uh, right? Yeah. So you're forced, had to into the, you're forced into this innovation and I think the D school, like when we talk about the Stanford Design School, it's a place where lots of disciplines and lots of subject matter experts from medicine and from the School of Engineering and from the business school and from architecture, they all come together and they put these crazy remixes and these crazy business models and products and ideas with all different inputs together. And I think that that's a, a, a pretty good way for humans to start to think about themselves as, you know, able to go super deep into something that you want to be a subject matter expert in, but then uh, being able to be conversant, at least in a thin layer, across yeah. lots, and lots and lots of different topics. And Brennan, can I mention something around that? One thing that I have, so I do a lot of mentoring also, and um and oftentimes with some of the folks that I mentor that are earlier in their career or they're just getting out of college and they're trying to figure out, well, what do I do? Where do I go? Yeah. Um, one thing that I want to share to not discourage folks is if you've got multiple interests, mm -hmm. that's okay. It's okay to have multiple interests, right? Um, a, not all of them will be monetized. Some of them will end up being hobbies. Yeah. Um, B, you can't forget you have to put in your 10,000 hours and be the top 1% of something. Yes. Um, if anybody's read the book uh, by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, mm -hmm. they talk a lot about putting in your 10,000 hours. He studied a ton of either pro athletes, hockey players, for example, and some of the, the, um, some of the highest executives in tech. And what was the thing that was the parallel between them? They put in their 10,000 hours in it, right? Um, and, and that I think often with, you know, I'm a millennial, call it, and, and with our millennial age, we often, with our, with our generation, excuse me, we sometimes forget that we have to put in that 10,000 hours. Folks see me and they're like, oh, you're young, you're under 40, you got 40 under 40, uh, from the network journal, you've been doing all these great things, but forget, I put 10 hard years in, yeah. 10 hard years in grinding uh, at, in sales in a, tech, in a tech company, the same tech company, right? And there were times, it was hard. There were times I was like, what the heck am I doing? Why am I doing this? But I loved it enough or liked it enough that I knew that it was something I could put my 10,000 hours in. I didn't go put those 10,000 hours into being a professional dancer. I did do some of it on the side, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't where I put my 10,000 hours, right? And so I think oftentimes you, you get, um, you know, follow your heart or go do all the things that, that bring yeah. you happiness. 
it's okay to have all of those interests, but know that you've got to put your 10,000 hours in somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to, you've got to be in the top 1% of something. And then the third thing I would say is once you've done some of that, try taking some risks and putting those, what you've learned in those 10,000 hours somewhere completely different. Throw yourself in the pool and see where you swim versus sink. Yeah. Because those areas where you swim versus sink, those are succinct to you. That's unique to you. That's not because of circumstance, not because of the job, not because of the city you were living in or the person you were dating at the time. It, it's specific to you and your quality. Um, and so I just, I don't want to encourage anybody if they've got multiple interests, but at the same time, you cannot forget, you got to put in that time, yeah. that 10,000 hours. Maybe a follow-on question to that is like, what's it, one example of, um, you throwing yourself into something that might have been uncomfortable, you know, after you put that time in um, to just see if you fly or see if you fall after that airplane gets thrown off the cliff. What's one example from, from, from your story? Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, so I uh, and Brandon, you were you were uh, here for this. So, you know, um, some of this story are, are already. Um, so after being in sales for, gosh, 12, uh, 12 or so years, um, I took on a leap to take on a strategy role, almost as a, think of it as a um, business consultant uh, for a portion of our business within the company I work for right now in, a, in an emerging market uh, for the continent of Africa. Mm. And so I thought, but I thought to myself, well, I'm Nigerian. Yeah. I guess I could kind of figure it out. Um, I know go-to-market strategies because I've had to sell in the Americas and they have global presence in other places around the world. So it shouldn't be too bad. I've got relatives who live in Africa. My significant other knows about Africa and kind of has, has a strong network across uh, the continent that could kind of help me navigate. How hard could it be? Yeah. Holy smokes. <laughs> strategy and deep consulting is totally different than sales totally different than sales um and i learned very quickly the same muscles that made me successful in sales while they could lend themselves to the new space they weren't going to be the ones that helped me get to the top one percent or success um and so what i learned the hard way was I needed to build new relationships. I needed to lead through influence versus um, dire right, directionally or organizationally. Yeah. Um, I had to find other metrics for success that weren't just measurable, that weren't just measurable, which was you spend you know, uh, over a decade in sales, you are coin operated like you would not believe. <laughs> Um, and, and sometimes in that, because sales is typically an execution arm of the company, um, I don't want to say tactically driven, but execution driven um, based on what dollars can we get this week, this month, this quarter, this year. But when you're going to build out a strategy for uh, a continent and a developing and emerging market that will likely not hit its return or peak until the next five to 10 years, yeah. strategy looks very different. At least it looks very different to me. Um, and, and it really, really changed my perspective on how I think about strategy, how I think about emerging markets, and then also help how I grew as a leader because of it. Um, yeah. it was, it was fun. It was tough, but it was fun. Yeah. That's, uh, something that I think each person who's watching this needs to learn how to learn and then learn the things that you are willing to put that 10,000 hours into versus the things that um, you might take a course or two in college about something and right. realize that, oh, I don't wanna take any more biology for the rest of my life. Or like, you know, whatever it is, that's what it, it was for me, uh, chemistry and biology. Yeah. But um, I think it's as meaningful to learn what you don't like to do and what you don't prefer to do so that you can um, gear your energy and gear your efforts and steer that towards a thing that uh, you feel like God has put you on this earth to like actually accomplish. So um, I don't take, I don't take L's. I take, I, I call those L's like learnings more than I call them losses. Yeah. So you figure it out Definitely. and you keep it moving after that. So that's, um, 
something for everybody to put in their back pocket. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, I think that we can mix it up a little bit. Let's go to like a little bit of a lightning round. Uh, you mentioned a few books, so maybe we'll dive into some books and some movies and some some of the things that you um, really like to do. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask you a series of questions and then maybe first thing that okay. comes to your mind or first couple. Um, but maybe let's start with the book since you've already called out a couple. Um, you can give me three of the most recent ones or maybe three of uh, your favorites of all time. Uh, I know that there's so many titles out there to choose from. Maybe you can do both. Uh, three that, that you've recently done and then three that just sit up there as some of the tops. Okay. Um, I am a ridiculous bookworm, Brandon, as you know. I like, I review books, I read books, I listen to books, I sniff books, yes. I stand and take pictures with books. I'm just like, I'm a ridiculous bookworm. Um, so I'll give you both. My, my most recent, let me give you my most recent, not in my, my favorite of all time, I just read Connecting the Dots by ex Cisco CEO John Chambers. Mm -hmm. So Connecting the Dots. Um, loved, loved the sincerity in the book. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, both working for that company for a majority of my career, um, it felt very real to know that some of the stories in the book, you've been there and lived part of that. Um, so that I appreciated. I also appreciated the um, the focus around knowing what you're good at, honing in what you're good at. Yep. Don't focus on your weaknesses. There are other people that have strengths in those areas. Mm -hmm. Let them shine in those areas that you're weak. You focus on your strengths, which I really appreciated. So love that book. Um, another book that I just read, and I am going to forget the author, uh, African-American woman also, but the, the book is called Influencer. See, now I'm going to have to like get the name of the author because it's going to bug me and I've got to tell you who it is. But the book is called Influencer. And um, I read it not because, yeah, I'm going to go up tomorrow and all of a sudden become a social media blogging yeah. queen and, and, and get get um, my revenue from that. But I, I listened to it because it talks a lot about your brand and how to handle your brand. Yep. Um, and, and we talked a little bit about how artists going forward, we're going to be, we're all brands, right? Essentially artists, creative people, executives, um, we're all brands. And how are you leveraging that? How are you communicating that? How are you being consistent with that brand is what I appreciated from the book Influencer. Thank you. Brittany Hennessy. Brittany Hennessy, influencer. Um, yes, amazing book. All of these, Audible, listen to them. She, she narrates it herself. She's phenomenal. Um, so that was a good one. And then um, another one I just recently reread was Everything is Figure Outable. Everything is Figure Outable by Marie Forleo. I am a fangirl of that woman. I've read that book three times. Yeah. I have read that book three times. I advocate about it. I post all the time about it. I stalk mm -hmm. her on all social platforms. I mean, it's just an incredible example of someone just listening to themselves, their heart and their head mm -hmm. and being true to themselves and then making an entire career out of that. And that changed over time for her, but she was true to herself. And when, you know, herself said, go be a professional dancer, even though you've had, never had any dance training, she did it and she got on her grind and hustled and she was extremely successful. When they said, go be a life coach, she did it and hustled and was extremely successful. When it said, go be an author, she did it. And we're talking about her book today. So, you know, that just, you know, I would say those three were the most recent that really inspired me. Those are, um, so that last one is for sure, like on my, it's on my wish list on Audible. So I'll be, I'll be there soon. Um, but I think it's such an important idea for people, especially in this day and age, to be able to um, know that there's something hard on the other side of a door, but to not be intimidated because, yeah, uh, like you just said, like you've got the resources, we've got phones, which are 
gateways into all of the world's information. So it, it just takes time and passion um, in leveraging kind of all the resources that you already have available to you in order to get to that thing that's on the other side of the door. And yep. you're willing to sacrifice uh, the things that you might normally do in a day um, or the money that you might normally spend or the time that you might normally dedicate to something that won't necessarily lead to anything then that dream or that goal that you have is is for sure like achievable and and, and within your grasp uh, over some number of weeks some number of months or some number of years so i think yep. that's an important uh point to sit on for a second and tell people uh encourage people to uh to move forward with any things like that you got a closed door in front of you don't be afraid to open it but you got to put that work that's in that's right that's right uh, so we could either go to the greatest books of all time, or we could talk about um, what you're watching or favorite place like destinations traveled. I know you've been around the world a couple of times, so I'll let you choose the oh. uh, next category. Oh, man. Oh, I really got to give you my favorite books of all time. Okay, let's do I it. I got to give you those. Okay. Um, number one and game changer for me was the top 10 distinctions between millionaires and the middle class. Hmm. I will caveat this. I don't like classism and I do not like the word millionaires and middle class as a distinction. Yeah. If you were to change millionaires and put extraordinary yeah. and change middle class and put average, I would be more comfortable with the book. Yeah. I saw the title and was pissed off and was like, I've got to read this because I'm, I don't, I already don't like where this is going. <laughs> But it really opened my eyes, really opened my eyes. One of the things they talk about in the distinction is, let's switch the words up. Average people, middle class, average people think about either month, plan for month to month or year by year. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary people or millionaires plan in decades. Hmm. When I started making decades plan, my strategies for what was the next step didn't make sense to my average friends or my yeah. average mentors or my average colleagues. It didn't make sense yeah. because it was part of a much more of a much bigger plan uh, across the decade. I mean, light bulb, that book, top 10 distinctions between millionaires and middle class just blew my mind by Keith Cameron Smith. Um, Rise by Patty Azzarello. I have like told people about that. I've like put it on to leadership teams. I've had, uh, uh, I was actually really surprised that uh, uh, a VP at our company got on a company meeting in front of 75,000 people and was like, my whole team's reading Rise by Patty Azzarello and Esther told us to read it. And I'm like, all right, I guess it's getting some traction, but that's not me. That's, that's how amazing Patty Azzarello is. It's one of the youngest um, uh, uh, senior vice presidents and GMs of a an entire business unit for one of the top tech companies in Silicon Valley over the last 20 years. I mean, she's just uh, she had a phenomenal career and gives all her secrets away in this book. Yeah, and it's 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 you can take it and it's applicable to really anybody. So I'd say those those two, and then the third. Um, the five love languages by Gary Chapman. Yep. And now Gary's gone on to provide different books of those five love languages, five love languages of not just in relationships, but also of your children or the five love languages within the workplace. Um, but I like that in particular because it's helped me understand people receive appreciation, love, praise, high five. Yeah. Um, uh, recognition differently. Yep. And the minute you figure out how to do that with other people, you have unlocked like true unconditional love, right? It's kind of like, and I, my husband and I, or fiance and I were talking about this the other day. Um, we recognize and talked about this in the book. At times, he might be screaming, I love you in Japanese, and I'm screaming, I love you in French, but it doesn't matter how loud we're screaming. Yes. We won't understand each other. <laughs> True love is when 
yeah. he goes and he learns a little bit of French and I learn a little bit of Japanese and we at least figure out how to meet each other halfway with that. That is true love, commitment, dedication to your team, whatever that is where you show that love, right? So I would say of those, those are the three like have to read books that I just love. So then side note or sidebar on that last book, what's your, I mean, people have different ones, right? What, if you were to categorize your top two love languages out of the five, what are you? Number one, quality time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I, gift giving is like at the bottom for me. Yeah. Um, I, I give gifts a lot. Um, I just, if someone was like, oh, what do you want for your birthday? My first thing would be, I would love for you to fly here and be here on my birthday, yeah. right? Um, so I would say quality time. And then I say acts of service. Mm -hmm. But oh, me, my fiance says um, it's physical touch because I'm always like, oh, can I sit right next to you? And I'm like way too hot. And he gets annoyed because he's like, God, it's... Your, your whole body is like a heater. Can you sit over there versus over here? Yeah. Um, so he says mine's physical touch, but I would say it's um, acts of service. Cause there's, there's no, I don't know. I just, when someone takes the time to understand what it is you might need and they spend the time with you to give you something you might need or help you with that thing or show up for you in a way um, that to me is, is the true showing of love. Yeah, that's acts of service is actually my number one. And I've dedicated a bunch of my time to try to be the bridge between kind of those who have opportunity and access and then those who come from like um, underrepresented minority yeah. communities don't have it. And it means so much like when you uh, get somebody who's willing to take your cause and like advocate for it. And then when the story, um, fully comes together and that person gets a job or that person gets the opportunity to do the thing or be the thing that you you always knew that they could be, um, that means a bunch. And to know that those people who are those gateways um, doing those acts of service to make those two sides come together, like mm -hmm. that's, that's where it is for me, so. Um, and the world is that much better for it, Brandon. I myself have, have certainly been one of those people you've done that for. And many are watching this show right now are are benefiting from your work. And so thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Um, let's go to, so we did books. We exhaustively, everybody yeah, watched, we, we, we gave you all some homework. Uh, so if you're tuning into this, that's six um, bangers that you guys have to go check out. That's right. Um, that's right. So let's go to, we could either do like movies and shows or we can go to the travel and like awesome places that you've been and you would recommend. So I'll give you those two choices for next. Ooh, I'll, I'll tell you what I just watched right now. I'm not a big TV person. Um, I get forced to from <laughs> my fiance who does it instead. And then I got sucked in because I can't stop watching. Yeah. We just watched the um, Spanish queen, mm -hmm. which if you go back, there's like three chapters. There's the Spanish queen that was most recent, maybe several years ago there was the white princess and then prior to that was the white queen and mm. it talks about queen elizabeth in the 1400s and it really goes through um the history of england there's a little bit of a twist to the story but they make it real you live what they they the relationships they go through life is a bit of history but a little bit of um fiction in there as well so that i just watched which i thought was pretty interesting some great leadership lessons love lessons, life lessons in there, uh, which I really love. Uh, best destination, three. One, um, Okinawa, Japan. Hmm. And what touched me the most about that trip was I was there on a, an armed forces tour with the San Francisco 49ers when I was cheering with them at the time. And we visited a um, naval base mm -hmm. in Okinawa, Japan. And it was a tiny, tiny base, just a, a, a general and his family. And they'd adopted a young uh, local girl or an orphan in the community. And then it was just the people that were keeping up the base there yeah. that lived there. And we got to go there and be, we got to go there and be their little taste of America. 
mm. um, from all the way far away. They're helping protect um, and serve all the way there and dedicating their entire families to go do that. And it was just our way to go and, and bring them a little taste of America to let them know that we're appreciative of their service so that we can live the free lives that we live. So that was number one. Um, I would say number two was um, visiting Nigeria, but not going to visit family, mm -hmm. going to visit it through my body of work um, and seeing, seeing what my life could have been like yeah. if my grandmother or my grandfather or my mom had made one change in a decision. Mm -hmm. It just, it just opens your eyes to the amount of privilege uh, that we that we have, quite frankly. Um, so, so that just um, opened my eyes. And then, third, and just my most fun place would be um, Mykonos, Greece. It's just such a beautiful place. Um, inexpensive. I mean, to get there is pretty expensive, but just inexpensive to live and love and explore, yeah. and just loved it. Very cool. I. I... I've got Okinawa. We, we've been to Tokyo and to Kyoto before, but not to Okinawa before. Right. And then um, never been to Greece. So that's that's one I'll even put on my own bucket list. So uh, thanks for, for dropping those for us. How about sure. uh, top three maybe cuisines or foods that you enjoy? Um, I know people, yeah. are foodies who like tune into this and like look for recommendations, <laughs> and, like different and you mentioned a bunch of different cultures that you've been in and out of, raised in and out of. So I'd be curious to know that. Yep. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I love my agusi soup and amala, which is Nigerian food. Yeah. Have to have it. So that's number one. Number two, I'm a sucker for some good sushi. Mm. I'm a sucker for some good sushi. Um, and then number three, Mexican food. Nice. Um, maybe the last one that I'll ask, um, you mentioned sports. So like you mentioned the NBA, the NFL, and then kind of traveling, um, for different teams to do this. You have a favorite sport or have a, uh, favorite league that you had good experiences with in terms of like dancing for them and cheering for them or are all sports created equal? kind of from a playing so perspective. pretty much what you're saying is <laughs> which was your favorite NFL or NBA? <laughs> yeah. And even if you, I don't know if you guys uh, did sports like your sisters and you like growing up, um, I played basketball and soccer a little bit, but like, nice. um, did you have a particularly like, what was your experiences with sports um, in dance and then outside of dance? Maybe we'll wrap, wrap yeah. with that. Yeah, no, no, great question. So um, I, I experienced, I will say, soccer uh, and netball a few times when I was younger and realized really quickly that wasn't my thing. Okay. <laughs> um, so that wasn't my thing. But, but um, I did realize, though, with, with um, uh, dance and I'll call musical theater a bit of a sport, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I appreciated the the, the teaming aspect of it, like you're dancing for the person next to you or you're, mm -hmm. you know, when you're doing improv, for example, you just got to roll with it yeah. for the person next to you. Right. Um, and so th that aspect of what I've experienced uh, growing up, I liked, um, I would say uh, later on in life and, and you know, uh, I guess U S based mm -hmm. leagues and sports, um, I like the game of football a lot better than I did the NBA. I love, as a dancer, I love dancing yeah. uh, as an NBA dancer. I enjoyed it. I was at, I was my most technical at that time. Yeah. Um, but I love the sport of football. It is like a game of chess. There's yeah. just so many, they can't be one to two or three players that hold the entire team. Yep. It really is a contact sport for all players that have to do their part which that to me, the teaming aspect of it is, is really important, so. You mentioned uh, the eternal student in me wants to know what netball is, and I've never heard of it. <laughs> so tell myself and tell everybody else what netball is. 
the best way I can describe it, uh, I've only really seen it uh, popular in the UK or from any of my British friends, but it, it's, um, you still have uh, two nets on the end of a court, much like basketball, but you're not bouncing the ball. You're doing a lot more passing. I'll give you that. <laughs> Other than that, with the details, you may have to Google it. Yeah, I have to get on YouTube and uh, do some netball. That's my homework coming out of this conversation. So um, yeah. I know we're right at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much for uh, getting together with me. I'm hoping that the folks that tune into this will learn a whole bunch and follow up uh, on any questions they have. Um, Esther's on social media and different places around the web. So if you wanna um, check on her work, feel free to do that. But maybe uh, last word, you know, one or two things that you want folks to take away, uh, some encouragements as we move from 2020 over into 2021 pretty soon here. Uh, feel free to take a minute or two. Yes, yes, definitely. Three things. I like bringing things in threes. Number one, don't forget you've got to put in your 10,000 hours and be in the top 1% of something. Mm -hmm. Of something. That's number one. Number two, learning doesn't end with school. Learning doesn't end with school, which is why I'm a ridiculous bookworm. There's so much to learn out there. And people give away this knowledge close to free, only for a few dollars at times in a book. So just never forget, learning doesn't stop with school. And there are so many others that can help support your, your journey there. And then number three, you are you are you. And there's nobody else like you. Nobody and there's no other value. There's nobody else that can provide what you can provide. Do not rob this world of your legacy because somebody out there needs it. Somebody has been praying for it. Somebody's been waiting for that business you've been wanting to start or that cure you're thinking of or that league you want to start or that, you know, that music that you're going to come out with that's going to change their perspective about life. Who are you are you and, and you were put here to bring that to, to bear. So once you figure out what that is and you soul search, um, don't, don't, uh, don't rob the world of it, yeah? Amen to that. And um, that last one made me think about, I was listening to an intro to an album and DJ Jazzy Jeff was talking about a bunch of stuff he learned in the uh, music industry. But one thing he said was uh, that he was content to die empty, which means that mm -hmm. all the creative ideas that come, yeah. even if he won't financially benefit from it all, uh, they can mean so much to somebody once you put them out into the world. And creativity is um, is is something that's always gonna be flowing through all of us. So I would encourage everybody Ooh. watching this, two words, die empty. Like take everything that uh, makes you, you, and put it out there for other people to benefit from and enjoy. Yeah. And impacts that you'll see from that. Um, I don't even know if the world is ready for so <laughs> <laughs> I'm tweeting that Brandon that was beautiful yeah, it's a great Love way it. to end it um happy Friday Esther thank you again so much on behalf of the community college fam here and the D school and Stanford and all the the team here we thank you so much for what you're doing uh and we'll be forever rooting for you as you move forward so um thanks so much for popping by the green room and we will see you next time thanks so much Brandon all right see you Bye.